very encouraged to see there's more than 10 people here. <laughs> I, I enjoyed working with the Alumni Association a lot the last month or so planning for this um, because yeah, we're, we're all alums of this program at this university. Um, but there was a time last week when we were emailing back and forth and we did have 10 RSVPs. And when I counted up all of our spouses and the few people from the alumni office, um, there was nine and I made 10. So I was a little concerned. Um, so this is great. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thanks for um, coming to celebrate with us and to share a little bit about um, our, our journeys, where we've been uh, in the last number of years, some more than others, in our uh, doctoral studies into these books. So as you walk by that table, um, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, sleepless nights, and things that went behind all those books. So thanks for being here for that. Um, I also feel really privileged to um, be able to reflect on this, not just with alumni, but with students. Uh, uh, students in many of our own classes, as well as peers and colleagues, uh, and particularly my own, our own, all of us, I may even say our own mentors in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, like Dr. Flint, Dr. Ebe, who are here with us. Um, many of you will know their, their names from book publications and other, other things like that, and they've been really important to what we do here, uh, and I think, again, speak for all of us, really formative to how we all do what we do. Um, but I'm also very aware that it's a dangerous thing to ask uh, five academics, can you tell me in 15 minutes what you've been up to for the last decade? Um, we said we're going to end at 9 o'clock and we had coffee there to keep you up as long as possible, but we're going to try our best. So how do you talk about a book that started off maybe as a term paper or dissertation and then grew and snowballed into something that's, uh, that's this thick? Uh, in 15 minutes, um, no less. I wanted to get at that tonight for uh, for my project by looking at really what is what's going on in just, just two pages of this book. Um, there's a million things going on uh, that I, I could talk about. In, in my view, there's uh, a few that strike me as, as interesting topics, given our, uh, our theme for the night of uh, reimagining the scriptural past. So I want to do that tonight, uh, get it really two pages. But before I do that, I wanted to start with a little bit of a story um, that I think relates to uh, to this topic. Um, I know if uh, I've, I've had a number of my own students from uh, this semester and past semesters, I'm always telling ridiculous stories about my kids because that's the phase of life I'm at. But I had a conversation recently with our daughter uh, where one of the highlights of my week, every week, is uh, sitting around the breakfast table and hearing the dream reports from a five-year-old girl uh, is never short of incredible. Usually there's a fairly, fairly stable plot uh, consistent cast of characters. Uh, there are puppies, there are stuffed toys, the odd pony for variety. Um, but it always starts my day on the right foot when there's always the hero. That robust rescuer dad who kicks down the door and somehow saves the day. And I, I'm always capped in that role and it helps me get out the door. The <laughs> but she said something to me recently that struck me as, as, as very telling. A very, uh, a very clever thing she said. At the end of a dream report in the last week, she said, um, but it was just a dream. My, my mind made it up. Uh, and I thought, well, isn't that cute? But isn't there something to that? The, the Hebrew professor in me wanted to correct her grammar and say, well, honey, that's not how you make a past tense verb. In English, you say made it up. But the Aramaic dreams kind of scholar within me really appreciated that she, what she was saying in that little phrase was very telling of something that we think of today when we think about dreams. Uh, that phrase, my mind made it up, is a very modern understanding of what dreams are. It's a very uh, Western understanding of what dreams are that are really linked to, um, in more than one way, probably the, the, the pivotal point to be the work of, of Sigmund Freud, where today most of us would think of uh, dreams that we have as being somehow symptoms of uh, your, your, your cognitive capacity or some other element related to your physiological stage, right? Um, maybe you've been thinking a lot about uh, that prom date years ago that didn't go well, so you have dreams about it, or you ate too many pieces of pizza at 11 o'clock at night and you dream about it. Um, but there's something that has to do with your mind and body that impacts the way that we dream. So my mind made it up. That's something that we would probably, in, one way or another identify with today. But where things get interesting for us in this topic and the text that I was able to deal with in my, in my project was if we rewind to a time before that, 
before that idea is kind of a cultural, uh, culturally operative understanding, <laughs> to a time when dreams weren't something that came from within, but they were perceived as being things that were dispatched to you, perhaps from a divine source. Now we see this understanding um, all over the place in the ancient Near East, in Greco-Roman literature. Uh, for many of us here, probably the most familiar place would be in, in the Bible, certainly in the New Testament, as well as in the Old Testament. Um, there are a handful of texts we could look at to ask, well, how are the biblical authors understanding revelation, how this can work? Um, I just want to share two with you to kind of give us a sense of the whole. The clearest one would probably be this text here in Numbers 12, which is, again, a text that we found at Qumran, which is kind of interesting. And in this text, we hear from the God of Israel, it says, well, when I speak to your prophets, here's how it can work. Uh, and one of the ways it can work is through dreams and through visions. Now, that all sounds well and good, but if you read a little further on in the, in the Old Testament, you see that it isn't too long until you bump into problems with that basic perspective. Because what happens all of a sudden when you have somebody, a prophet, or an individual who says, I had a dream, um, they claim revelation, but in fact their, their revelation is, is contrived. Um, to borrow on that phrase again, what happens when it was just their mind that made it up? How do you tell the difference? Uh, in these few passages in the Old Testament, we start to see some of that tension. And I find it very interesting that if we trace this development further, we see that, that tension work itself out in other books in the Bible, other books in ancient Judaism, and a number of other texts at Qumran, where there's this spectrum of openness, that yes, God can reveal himself, but that ongoing question of how do you tell if it's a real, uh, viable, authoritative revelation. Now, if we were to kind of chase that further, we would, one of the places we could chase that would be to the uh, Qumran finds, to these texts that Dr. Flint has introduced us to. And there are a number of places in there we could see that, that tension. Um, in the few minutes we have, I want to just look at the two areas of this collection, two kind of subsets within this, this library, and bring them to bear on one another. One of them is perhaps familiar to us, uh, Daniel. We saw Daniel fragment a few minutes ago. The book of Daniel, we are all familiar with this, right, from the Old Testament. Um, it's one of my favorite books. It's just a good read. The value that we had from the Qumran finds is that we had a number of Daniel texts, uh, at least eight Daniel texts that were found in the original languages of the book, in Hebrew and Aramaic, which is, is pretty important for us to study that book on its own. But for my money, the more impactful discovery is a number of other texts that are similar to Daniel in one way or another that give us a new, fresh context for discussing and describing this book that we're already familiar with. So that's what I want to look at tonight, is a, a series of texts that were, like Daniel, written in Aramaic, at least like Daniel 2 7. They're written around about the time of Daniel, um, the third to first century, is where it will be. But most importantly, like the book of Daniel, we find these texts that have uh, a number of dream visions tucked away within them. And that's what I want to focus on for, uh, for tonight. So before moving into new text, why don't we start with uh, what we already know. If you've read Daniel at some point, you know that Daniel is one of these dreamers. He's also a dream interpreter. Um, as I read Daniel, I think there's a lot more going on in there. Uh, in Daniel 2 to 7, we have uh, a number of familiar stories, right? Daniel in the lion's den. Um, we have, in there he finds time to survive in Inferno with his best friends. Um, he coins the phrase, the writings on the wall, and he does this all along the way of uh, getting a promotion in the empire. Um, my favorite Daniel stuff, though, is some other materials you may not be familiar with. Uh, there are traditions of Daniel from the ancient world, um, like Bell and the Dragon. If you've read this story in the Apocrypha, um, then you know that Daniel conquers a dragon by feeding it a giant hairball. I don't know why, as Protestants, we don't read the Apocrypha. <laughs> there is such a richness to it. Um, if there's not a sermon illustration there, I don't know. I can't help you. All that to say, Daniel is all over the place in the ancient world in these texts we now call biblical texts and Septuagint texts, as well as at Qumran. But if you know the book of Daniel, you know that it really culminates in these chapters. Probably chapter 7 would be the, the most important one, where Daniel has this very vivid dream this dream, uh, or, uh, where he's interpreting a dream, rather, for, for Nebuchadnezzar. And this dream is of four horrific beasts coming out of the ocean, devouring one another, trampling on everything. 
And these have been read in some very intriguing ways over the years. This symbolism has been uh, read down through the ages by different communities to mean different things. Um, I kind of like old junk, surprise, surprise, I work in Dead Sea Scrolls studies. But I like vintage kind of depictions of uh, biblical interpretations through the ages. And here's a few that I've come across in the past number of years of uh, 19th and 20th portrayals of people trying to ask that classic question of how does the Bible relate to my own day? How does Daniel's prophecy specifically relate to my own day? And as you can see here, um, they're trying to map that out from Daniel 2, that vision of the, uh, the this four, four-tiered um, statue to Daniel 7. And as you can see on this example on the bottom, uh, they run the map all the way down to their own day in 1843. Now these stories, we hear this quite often in our own day of groups trying to uh, decode the Bible or to, to figure out when the end is going to happen, and usually it's kind of right around the corner, right? Um, spoiler alert, the world didn't end in 1843. Uh, this would be a, a significantly less uh, well-attended event if it did. But the idea here is, I can't agree with the, the calculations, I don't think any of us would, um, but I think we can appreciate that these are, these are People or communities are trying to see how, what did that mean? What did that passage mean um, then? What did it mean for us now? Even if their conclusions seem a bit off to us. Because in Daniel 7, if we were to um, crack open a biblical commentary and ask, what are most scholars of the Bible saying is going on in here? Uh, most scholars of the Bible are probably going to say something like, well, Daniel 7, these four beasts, aren't pointing towards modern day events or governments they're most likely pointing towards ancient empires. Ancient empires of the, the author Daniel's own day. And they would probably point to these four. They would say, likely uh, Babylon was, was first in the queue, Media, Persia, and then Greece. And Greece would have been about the time that this book was written, uh, or when the empire of Greece was uh, ruling in the Hellenistic period. So there's that ancient context that most would agree is, uh, is is probably the best context to think about for this book, at least to begin with. But what happens then for these ancient Jews in this period that uh, Dr. Flint's introduced to us, when the world, yeah, didn't end, when the eternal rule of God didn't come, um, when the, the Greek, uh, the Hellenistic rule kind of dwindled, when the dawn of the Roman Empire came, and business kind of continued as usual. Well, what do you do with a book that was supposed to prophesy how things would come to an end, and the end didn't come? Um, this is kind of, I think, the first place we see, in, in, in my knowledge, in ancient uh, Israel and Jewish literature, a writer trying to expand on that. And here's just the one new Qumran text I want to introduce to you. Uh, the text I want to share with you here is called Four Kingdoms. At least that's the modern title it goes by. And Four Kingdoms, as its name suggests, gives us another kind of uh, revised dream vision, a revised dream vision that also looks for four kingdoms that uh, point towards perhaps when the rule of God will let you show up. So I've got this for you here. As you know from uh, the, the presentation we had earlier on, most often we're not dealing with Dead Sea Scrolls, we're dealing with Dead Sea Scraps, and you can tell from even the image here, this, are, this text is, is, is in a very fragmentary state. But even within this context, we can see we hear some pretty suggestive things. This text is a dream vision text. It seems like it was a text something like Daniel. Either a, a pious Jew had this dream, or a pagan king had this dream and it's been interpreted. And it involved four empires as well. Now the empires, the kind of symbolism that we see here is not a statue like in Daniel 2, or beasts like in Daniel 7. It's in fact for, for talking trees. Um, if there's any place in the world where we can appreciate that, that symbolism, it's here in British Columbia, right? This was a Dead Sea Scrolls text destined to be studied here. We have four talking trees in this dream. If we read through this text, we could gather some hints as to who the empires are behind these, um, behind these symbols. And this is where it gets interesting. In the blue text in line one there, we see reference to four trees. Okay, great. We know there's four here. It's not five, it's not six, it's not three, there's four. What we see in the text then that follows is this dreamer is looking around and asking these trees, well, what is your name? Who are you? And the dream or the, the tree reveals its own identity. We have a great place to start with the first tree in the green text says, well, my name is Babylon. Okay, simple, great. We know where we're starting. And the response of the dreamer here is, well, you're the one who rules in Persia. 
So for us, we could see already that we have the first tree is identifying itself as some sort of hybrid uh, empire of Babylon, Persia, this kind of general, generic imperial foe in the east. So we have tree number one taken care of. Tree number two is where things start to get interesting for us. If we look in the purple text, it becomes more and more fragmentary as the text dwindles. Here we have a dreamer who says, well, I looked to the west and I saw this tree. We don't have its name available in this text that survived, but we know that it was a, uh, an empire over in the west, and we know from the next statement that it had vigor or strength over the seas and the harbors, presumably a empire that, or a ruling uh, kingdom that had power over perhaps the Mediterranean, over the seas. Here, I think, we could say with some, some measure of certainty that Greece is perhaps the empire we want to have in mind. So if we start with Babylon, Persia, we end up with Greece in the second slot. Things get more and more fragmentary. By the end of this text, we have just mention of a third tree. Well, who is the most likely candidate for that, that one? If we do our historical homework, we look at some other ancient texts that play at this game, and they rank these empires in succession, we probably know that Rome would be the, the natural successor to the to Hellenistic rule. So we have Babylon, Persia, we have Greece, and then we have Rome. Now, if we want to kind of look at Daniel 7, we know that after Greece, well, divine rule didn't come, but there was this other text now that comes along trying to update that oracle. They add Rome into that third position. Now it seems this text is doing something interesting, because the author of this text seems to be suggesting that well, we had Babylon and Persia, we had Greece, we have Rome. Just around the corner, perhaps, is this fourth kingdom, the, the kingdom of God, the eternal rule of God. So we have a slight shift, but the shift is pretty significant given our theme tonight because I think what it reminds us of is that at least a text like this shows perhaps how this one writer this one time saw imperial history happening in a way that they're expecting, but then when things didn't end the way they should have ended after the imperial rule of, uh, of the Greeks, there's a need to update history to see how it relates to their own day. And that's really, I think, the, the, the main point I wanted to draw our attention to is that we do ask that question of how does the Bible relate to your own day? And that's not an old, that's not a new question. In fact, it's something that's, that's very old. So we looked at one text, we thought about it perhaps in like Daniel, and I want to just kind of give us three takeaways perhaps that we could, uh, we could be thinking of for this topic, for this text, as well as for other kind of strategies for reading the Bible. So the first one, I think, is there's a possibility here that this text is very much so intentionally interpreting Daniel. As Dr. Flint showed us a moment ago, the scrolls are not just great for seeing our earliest copies of the biblical text, but we can see how there are early Jews that are trying to make sense of Scripture in light of their own world. This could be a great example of that if this text came out again. So that's kind of point number one. The second one that to me is very interesting is uh, the idea of doing this through the, the vehicle of a dream vision. If we think of this world as being a world where dreams and visions are almost often thought to be sent from, um, from the divine, then that's an authoritative statement. That this person's not only trying to interpret scripture, but they're saying, ah, this dream gives this new interpretation of authoritative backing, which is also something that's quite interesting to think about in this ancient context of Qumran. <coughs> Now, the last thing is, uh, I, I generally try to end lectures on a high note, um, but tonight, just for the sake of variety, I thought I would end with some thoughts on the end of the world. Uh, I know it's a Tuesday night, I know that it's the rainy season, so I hope this doesn't bring you down. Um, but if we think of where we've been, we started off by looking at some of the material in Daniel, um, and a few of those depictions in, in 19th and 20th century interpretations, and then looking at Qumran. Uh, as we said, the world didn't end in 1843. The world also didn't end when Rome crumbled, uh, and the world didn't end at any point in between when communities thought it might. Um, that's something that we, we see happen throughout the history of interpretation. But we see that in texts like this text at Qumran, or in these other representations, that people are asking that question, what does the text mean to us today? That's a good question. The test, that's a question we should be asking. But I think for the type of literature we're dealing with in Daniel, in Revelation, and other Jewish and Christian apocalypses, I think the larger message isn't, well, we need to figure out exactly how things will happen and when. I think the larger message here, and the more meaningful one for us even today, I think is a message of hope. <clears throat> that the, the course of history isn't as much of a big deal if one's God is the architect of history. Um, 
we might not know exactly how things will end in the same way that these other communities and readers um, didn't. But that isn't the point. The point is that there, as Daniel says, I think in chapter uh, 228, there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Um, he's the one who's behind it all. So that's a few moments uh, of a larger project, of a few insights of questions that I still have. Um, but I think these are some of the lessons we're starting to see from the Dead Sea Scrolls, just only starting to appreciate that things like scripture and tradition and community somehow hang together. And by reading their, uh, their library that they left behind, we can see some of that worked out in their own day. And I, I hope see spaces where we can kind of reflect on our own questions about scripture, tradition, and community uh, that we can wrestle with today. So thank you very much for, uh, for being here tonight and for, for sharing this with me.